Hello and welcome back to Cambro Conversations. Today's conversation, we're diving into a meaty topic and to do so, I'm joined by Adam Lane-Smith. Adam, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for so much having me on, brother. I've been waiting for this one, looking forward to it. And I love your accent. Yes, you were uh, you were fortunate to talk with uh, my friend David McIntosh and his podcast and you couldn't get enough of the Scottish accent, so you needed to get back on. Uh, is Exactly. I'm just making the rounds just to hear that accent. That's it. <laughs> and bring tremendous value as well, which I think is important. And I laughed when I was doing my research for this show. Obviously, I was telling you I'd heard you uh, twice on Modern Wisdom and I heard you on David's podcast and a number of other podcasts. I heard somebody introduce you as Adam Smith, which, of course, is a is a famous Scottish um, economist. And actually, the, the main building that I did my degree in at University of Glasgow is the Adam Smith building. Not the Adam Lane Smith building, although we can we can work towards getting some, I don't know, some sort of psychology department named after you, Adam. It's got to happen. It's got. I want people to look in the dis, in the dictionary and see mental illness and see my picture right under it. That would be perfect if we could do that. No, Adam Smith. My whole life, I have been Adam Smith, and people say that's not a real name. Show me your driver's license. Really prove that's your name. And then I started writing books on Amazon, and of course, you can't be Adam Smith on Amazon because you'll be result number three thousand five hundred. So Adam Lane Smith is what I got to go by. That's just the game. Yes, we've got to play the game, don't we? And. What a game you've been playing in the last couple of years since um, I found your content online. It's been something that I hadn't considered at all. And I guess if we were to start to define our terms, how did you start getting involved in the topic of attachment? Yeah. So I worked for a long time as a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, and to get there, you have to do six years, minimum six years of schooling for a master's degree through graduate school. Then it's three years of apprenticeship to get your licensure. And then you work as a licensed therapist. And I, and I did that. I was training other therapists and, and healthcare professionals. But in six years of grad school, the only thing we ever learned about attachment was it doesn't matter. <laughs> it was You only care about attachment if it's for little kids. That's the only time it matters. You won't even think about it if you treat anyone over the age of three. So just don't bother. And at six years of grad school, that's what we were taught. Three years of my apprenticeship. That's also what we were taught. Like, no, you can't diagnose attachment issues. That's for little babies. That's for kids. You're, you're a therapist for adults or, or for teens. Don't worry about it. You don't have to think about that. I read nine years into that process. And I hit, got my license and then read this groundbreaking book by Dr. Robert Glover that says it's called No More Mr. Nice Guy. And he talks about attachment. And I said, that's that's that thing that, that they told me never to worry about. But I've seen it so many places. And it like, like clicked. And then I start diving into that rabbit hole of what is attachment? Why is no one talking about this? Why has it never been discovered? And so it, I learned that there are some people talking about it. And, and Bowen came up with a theory and people have kind of talked about it. But to read about attachment, you got to read these huge, huge textbook books, like 300 pages kind of thing just to get through it. So I said, no, 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 we can't do this. So I wrote a 100 page guide called Slaying Your Fear that is designed for people who hate reading. Because I, before that, I wrote gunfight and car chase novels. And I knew I had to write punchy, fast, interesting for people who hated reading. So I wrote this little little guide, Slaying Your Fear. And I would hand it out to clients in my office when they came in and said, hey, I have this and this and this. I'd say, okay, I think there's this thing called attachment under it. Nobody else has probably ever talked to you about attachment. Here's a free 100-page guide. Go home and read this. Come back to me and we'll talk about it. And they would come back the next time, like tears in their eyes. The book marked to death saying, this was, I, I could did never believe that this was real. How could this, and, and just mind blown. And then session two would be, what do we do about this information now? What do we do and how do we fix it? And within a couple of weeks, I was solving problems all of a sudden that I had been told in grad school would take two or three years to solve. And we would be solving it in a couple of weeks once we got the attachment right. That that was my attachment journey of fixing that. It's just once you know it, man, everything clicks. Yeah, incredible. And I guess to do it in even shorter than a hundred page book, Adam, what is attachment? Good question. I've had to come up with the perfect definition. Attachment is the way one human being connects to another human being. Can you, the, the question here is, can you form a secure bond, a, a, a reciprocal circle of mutual fulfillment where you are giving and receiving love with each other and trusting that that bond will continue? Or do you not believe that that bond is there and it's not secure and you cannot work on mutual fulfillment? It is each one of you on your own and you either have to stay safe from other people or you have to make sure they don't abandon you by pleasing them. That's secure attachment and insecure attachment, which breaks down into anxious style and avoidance style. That right there is attachment. It, it's supposed to be a circle, a mutual fulfillment circle. And when it breaks, it's not. It's interesting that you mentioned that at grad school, the 
focused on it, but only for children. What was their reasoning behind that? The diagnostic manual, the diagnostic statistics manual that we use, the DSM here in America, it it diagnoses attachment specific concerns in little children. The idea with the, with the prevailing system is that an attachment issue, if it's severe enough to be diagnosed, will always become a conduct disorder in the teens and will always become a personality disorder in adulthood. So if you diagnose somebody with a personality disorder in adulthood, that's when you can tell they had attachment problems. It has to be that level of severity for you to look back and say, wait, you had attachment problems as a child. So they assess little children and babies who haven't grown into conduct disorders or personality disorders yet, and they tell them that they have reactive reactive attachment disorder or, or something like that, and, and they diagnose them with the attachment pieces. But blowing it up and saying, no, you can have attachment problems, and that contributes to generalized anxiety disorder. That contributes to major depressive disorder. That lowers the threshold to get PTSD when you face a trauma issue. That can cause and lead into perhaps bipolar disorder, or at least make it worse. Over in Finland, they've been doing some research on uh, schizophrenia and how fixing the family bonds without any medication at all, fixing that family bond, really fixing attachment, can almost almost eliminate the effects and the severity of, of schizophrenia in that person's life without any medication at all by fixing that attachment. It is amazing what attachment can do when you look at it. The medical system has just not caught up. If people are having their attachment addressed super early then, so like people with like really in, unstable, either anxious or what was the other term you used, avoidant attachment, mm -hmm. that's getting addressed super early, then why is attachment a problem further down the line? Are we just not catching enough of it early enough? It's not being addressed early enough. People take their kids in when there's a severe problem and then you can pay someone hundreds of dollars to analyze your kid. And there's not very many people who can do this and they're testers and there's only specific cases for it. Sometimes custody cases are things they can work on. Um, and then fixing that attachment is also not really talked much about. It, it's it's this tiny little niche that no one touches. But here's how attachment can break. It's, it's the child believing that whatever happens to them is their fault. So imagine a child who's born early, premature, or, or born with a problem. And they're in the NICU in, in here in the United States, the, the infant intensive care unit. They're in there for three weeks. Their mom can't touch them because they're, in, they're behind glass. Mom can barely touch them. The baby's crying, 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 crying. And nobody comes to comfort that child. And the child is stuck, 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 alone, isolated, cold, no smells, no nothing. The brain says something is wrong that nobody is coming to comfort me. Those first six life, six weeks of, uh, first six months of life are crucial to will people take care of me? Or am I in an environment where no one will help me? And if I'm in an environment where no one will help me, the brain starts thinking, I caused this somehow. This is my fault. This is why adults who have their, their parents got divorced. Many adults will say some, I, I don't, this isn't true, but somehow I've always believed my adult, my, my parents divorce was my fault. And I don't know why the child's brain says dad left before I was born. And I never met, I, before, I never met this guy. Like he shouldn't impact my attachment. No, the brain says, if I was a better child, dad would be here and dad is gone. You can have a wonderful stepfather who takes in and takes care of that role. But if the parents don't address it through that context explicitly and say, this is what happened. This is why it happened. Do you ever feel that you are afraid? Do you ever feel like you might be abandoned? Do you ever worry that you're a bad child? Do you ever worry that it was your fault? If they don't address it that way, the child's brain says, if I was a better kid, dad would be here. If the parents are depressed, the parents are depressed and they don't have time to invest in the child. And the child says, this is my fault. Mom is depressed. It's not mom is depressed. It's mom doesn't have time for me. If mom is away and the child's at daycare all day long, competing with, with strange kids for strangers approval. And the mom comes home exhausted and barely has time to put into that child. And that's the pattern for years and years and years, especially early on in life. The child's brain says something makes it so that mom is not wanting to spend time with me. It doesn't see the context. The child says, that's my fault. And over the years, this grows into huge, huge problems about believing about yourself or if you're harmed, believing also about other people and, and how you're not safe connecting with them. It, it, we, we miss it because so much of our culture is built on creating broken attachment and we don't think about it. The average, uh, the, the research here in the United States, I'll say this one last thing and then I'll pause for breath. The research here in the United States indicates that an estimated 50% of adults have attachment issues and 50% of adults have secure attachment. It's a 50-50 split. When you see two people, one of them probably has issues. So here in America, there's what, 375 million Americans, something like that. That's an awful lot of people walking around with those attachment issues. Yeah, undoubtedly, Adam. And I, I find it so interesting how our childhood shapes so much of what comes afterwards. But of course, 
those very early stages, if, for example, we aren't feeling the love from our parents that we, we hoped for, then it shapes our ability to feel love from other relationships as well further down the line, because a lot of the work that you do is on couples. And if you have had a problem as a child, then quite often the problem is reflected in the different like romantic relationships that you have down the line as well, which I find fascinating because that's probably the template that you've learned from in terms of if my mother doesn't love me, then perhaps this, 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 yes. this girlfriend that I've got doesn't love me either or won't and never can. And if I open up to her, I will create a burden. And if I share my needs, she will leave me because I'm such a problem. So I have to earn good boy points and re and make her reward me with, with if physical intimacy and affection. And I have to earn her approval the way I earned mom's approval. Yeah, that's, yeah, we reenact those situations over and over and over. Or if mom was terrible, it's avoidant of, I am going to keep women at arm's length and that's all they're worth to me. And that's all they can ever do. And I can never trust them. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, re, we rebuild those same patterns when we believe certain things about ourselves and about other people and how those relationships will act. Absolutely. I'd love to learn a little bit more around avoidant and then the, the other form of insecure attachment as well. So let's go into avoidant a little bit. Yeah. Now, how does that manifest? Like you said, there's a belief there that I cannot be loved because I wasn't loved in the way that I hoped to be as a child. Therefore, I can't get this love from another romantic relationship in the future. Yes. Avoidance, a lot of it seems to be stemming from more pain in childhood of hurt, of un, of cruel people, meanness, uh, instability, couldn't trust other people. So there's a belief that if you let people in, they will see that you're weak on the inside and take advantage of you, hurt you, attack you. They will hurt you. So you got to keep them at arm's length. A lot of here in America, the, the promiscuous hookup culture, it is built on avoidant people getting in there and saying, I will have false intimacy with these people and fake having a relationship with you, but I can step out any moment. And by the way, I'm a totally independent person who doesn't need anybody. I don't care if you have needs, stay away from me and you're getting too needy. I'm going to ghost you over and over and over. And it's this almost sense of power of getting those needs met. That right there is, it, it, it's on both sides of the political spectrum. It's on both sides of men and women. It's, it, it's just this brutal, nope, I have this wall up. You cannot step into this wall. I am going to keep everything and deflect with humor and deflect with everything and then just put the line down. And if you don't, if you cross that line, I'm out of here. I don't care. And anxious is I need approval. It, it's, it's, it sometimes is less about abuse. It typically is more about needing to earn that approval, needing to feel safe, feeling a ban that fear of abandonment. People are going to abandon me. I'm going to lose everybody. If I show who I am, there's something wrong with me on the inside that nobody can accept. So I am anxious all the time. I'm fearful. If I open up, I'm going to be a burden. No one will want me. So I have to be perfect all the time and earn your approval by doing 10 nice things for you. And then you will guess what I want. And you're so grateful to me that you will do what I need and read my mind. And, and that those two tend to chase each other. The anxious tend to chase the avoidant because the avoidant will never get too close and see who the anxious person is on the inside. So the anxious person can relax by just making the avoidant person feel good all the time. And the avoidant person feels good because the anxious person won't challenge them and push too deep and expect things from them. The anxious person will just chase them around and give them attention all the time. So it becomes this ugly circle of pe hurt people hurting people. But it's, it's this brutal system. And sometimes the anxious or the uh, the avoidant will connect with a secure person who says, like, what is going on? And they can play the game a little bit. But it's it is rough that this is what leads to so many divorces, affairs, uh, domestic violence, all kinds of problems. They stem from this because here's the game real quick. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to tell you this. Secure attachment allows you to connect like you and I are one human being to another. We're not trying to one up each other. We're having a good conversation. Hopefully everybody watching is enjoying this, but we're not, we're not trying to say, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm bigger than you are and my biceps are bigger and I'm smarter. No, we're, we're just having a good conversation. And, and if there's a problem, like we did before the show, like, Hey, here's my, here's these technical issues. Help me work through this. Yeah. Hey, you do this. We can just connect and we don't have to worry about looking bad, being exploited. Like, Oh no, I better guard myself. We're humans. We're humans and we are a team and we're going to work together. And I can trust you. You can trust me. That's treating people like humans. When you have attachment issues, you cannot treat people like humans. You have to put up a guard and push buttons to get the feeling and outcome you are looking for. You are treating people like objects to be moved. The extreme version of this would be, you know, a sociopathic, uh, psycho psychopathy, um, super narcissists, people who treat you like an object and don't care if they hurt you. People with avoidant issues aren't, are, and, and anxious issues aren't looking to hurt you. 
but they need to poke your buttons and treat you like a video game to try to get the outcomes they're looking for. That's what that because is. So it's treating to to lives. because they've had to do that all their lives. They then take that approach elsewhere. So I, I find that incredibly interesting. And you give a fantastic example in terms of you and I both acted in good faith to organize this discussion. When there was a change to the schedule that I pushed it back by a few hours, you were cooperative and we communicated openly. I didn't try and cloak and dagger say, can we move back a few hours for, and not give you the reason I was open in terms of what was going on in terms of the, the contractor works from my, from, my, from my apartment roof. But that is a very, very good example because if you don't communicate well, then it's very difficult to understand what some of these requirements and needs are. And I suppose when you're brought up in particular, the, the anxious person, they're scared to express what they maybe want and what their desires are and what they require. Whereas the avoidant person, I guess, they, they're maybe not scared to do it, but they just choose not to. Is that is that to protect themselves? It can be. Often they are drawing the lines and telling you what they don't want. And if you don't do what they do want, then they use that against you. They don't want to hear what you want because that will create responsibilities for them. It's people who have chronic commitment issues and say, nope, I don't even want to go that. No, we can't. We can't put labels on our relationship because then I will be trapped with you. No, we can't get married. Then I will be trapped. It's the people who never want to be trapped. The anxious people are like, please, let's handcuff ourselves together forever. But don't ask me any questions about how I feel or what I need. I am just here to serve you as a martyr for the rest of your life. It, it, it's that it's that disconnect. I don't know. What, I, don't, I don't want to know what you want or I don't want you to know what I want. Those are the two pieces that go in there. It's it's rough. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, a stable person might end up connecting with uh, either an anxious or or or, a, or an avoidant person. Mm -hmm. Is there is there the ability for the stable person to make the anxious or avoidant person more stable through their support? It can absolutely be fixed. Attachment is absolutely malleable and flexible. You can change it one hundred percent. Here's the problem is the person with the attachment issue needs to one, recognize that their behavior is abnormal. Most of them, all of them are doing it because they think that's the only way they can survive. So there is no questioning it. It's a law of the universe. It is water is wet. Gravity pulls things down and I'm an unlovable piece of crap. It's a law of the universe that you can't change. So when you convince them and show them otherwise, sometimes they get it and say, wow, there's a whole other way to do that. Like people who are watching this, people who listen to me speak, I often, they have that jaw drop moment of, wait a minute, that's not normal. I thought being anxious all the time and being terrified and not being able to speak, I thought that was normal. No, it's not. That's, it's that broken attachment. That moment, that jaw drop moment, they have to have that and then say, wait a minute, I want better with you. And then you have to share the context explicitly. You have to have this conversation and say, these are unhealthy things. These are healthy things. Let's do more of this and do this on purpose. And then you have a shared language around it, and then you can build that together. But it is all reliant upon the person with attachment issues, recognizing that there's a better way to be and choosing to do better, which is hard because their brain has wired vulnerability to death in their brain. It has wired exposing who they are to other people to death. Because when you're a little kid, when this forms, when you're two years old, if your parents abandon you, you will die. So the brain wires that together. So then you try to be open and honest with people and like panic attack level, terror level, like fight or flight. I can't do it. Closes the throat. Can't have the conversation. Can't make yourself do it. Be defensive instead. Run away. Ghost the other person. Just be nice and just earn their approval. That's what tends to happen. If you could break that cycle, yes, you can absolutely heal this. And, and there are cases of people with secure attachment showing them that love. That, In fact, that's one of the best ways to do it. That's the only way to do it is experiencing that love. That I secure love is the only way. Because you mentioned vulnerability. It probably takes a lot for an anxious or uh, an avoidant person to be vulnerable enough to share what's going on. And having a stable person to listen, to take that on board and to help you work through that is probably one of the most valuable tools. Whereas I suppose if yes. the anxious and avoidant come together or they come together with somebody exactly the same attachment style as them, it's just it's just a train a train wreck, I suppose, in terms of how they go back and forth. Absolutely. It is. It's when, when it's just, it's just reinforces and then they both get worse through it because they think it's normal and their brain says, Oh, it's good that I have these attachment problems. And that's what the brain is saying. Like, good, keep these behaviors. This is the only thing keeping me safe. I think of the, the extreme red pill circles where it is taught that avoidant behaviors in men are good because women will hurt you no matter what you do. So you must have attachment problems. And if you don't have avoidant attachment problems, you are 
are worthless and they will eat you alive. So please have as many avoidant attachment as pro issues as, as possible and find as many anxious women as you possibly can to exploit for that because that's all that they really are anyway. That I, I'm looking at that and it's like, this is brutal. This is just teaching these things that they're good. And then they go out, those guys go out and hurt insecure women who then say, wow, men are scum. All men are terrible. And then we have our whole society fighting back and forth over who is the biggest piece of scum. Yeah, that's as we really looked at the, the two negatives. And I'm sure we can go into those in a bit more detail as well. But if I was to share an example with the listeners of stable attachment, what would that look mm -hmm. like? It is the person who can just be honest and open and say, here's what I need. Here's what I need. You know, I, I actually, I have an even better. I have an even better. I can do it. You have three minutes. I can walk you through this guidance right here. Well, I can well, show you the okay. difference. Perfect. Okay. You're trapped. So for three minutes, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine this. And listeners at home, if you're driving, don't close your eyes, but you know, do it. be safe. I want you to imagine that you have the perfect partner in the world. Perfect. Perfect. And if you're, if you're with someone, I hope it's the person you're picturing. <laughs> I won't tell anyone if it's not picture the perfect partner in the world. And they, when they, when they want something from you, they ask you very upfront, very calmly. They say, Hey, you know, I would really like this. Could you please do this for me? This would mean a lot to me. This, and this is why this is important. Could you help me with this, please? Could you help me with this? And then they, when they want something and, and you want something, they just ask, they say, Hey, what can I do for you? What's helpful for you? Not trying to earn your approval, but just like, Hey, let's be honest with each other. Let's be open about these needs. When you do something they, they don't like, they say, oh, hey, you know what? You didn't know this and that's okay. So don't be embarrassed and I'm not mad, but I don't like that. Could you please do this instead? This would be really helpful. And they give you that exact behavior right away. No, no hemming, no hawing, no guessing games, just very clear. And they work with you like, hey, do this instead. This would be great. And when you do something they like, they praise you for it. And then they just stop and enjoy it. They say, thank you so much. This is so awesome. Maybe here's why it meant something to me. This is so cool. Thanks. And they, they sit there enjoying it. That right there, that's healthy attachment. So open your eyes and answer me three questions. Do you feel like this person trusts you? Yeah, completely. They, they tell me what they like. They tell me what they don't like. And I know how to respond. Good answer. That's perfect. Some people, extreme people will say, no, man, they're trying to get something from me. Like that's, that's avoid attachment usually right there. Yes, they trust you hundred percent. And that, that healthy behavior is good. Number two, would you feel if you were being told what was good, what was bad, being shown how to do better and then being praised for it, you were getting full feedback on both sides. Would you feel pretty confident about yourself? Good self-esteem as a partner. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you would be getting positive feedback the whole time in terms of whatever your behavior was. If they liked it, they would tell you. And if they didn't like it, they would tell you so you could make an adjustment to work together. So you always know it's true and you know you're doing a great job. Absolutely. Number three, would you feel secure and safe in this relationship? Like it was going to last a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's not really anything hidden. Um, there's a, like Jordan Peterson talks about kind of like hiding dragons or like not, not to, like to, to kind of paraphrase, not tackling the elephant in the room. It's very unlikely if somebody was able to communicate with you on that level that you would develop an elephant in the room because one of the things that I liked the most about what you said was if somebody was able to articulate particularly what they don't like, then you don't leave little things festering. So there might be particular phrases that you use or little habits that you have at the dinner table or something like that that just irk somebody. And if they never say anything about it for three months when you're seeing them and then five months when you're dating them and then one night it just gets too much of them and they bring it out then how, how are you to have guessed that they didn't like that because they never made it clear? So I, I love the way you've illustrated that, Adam, from a communication perspective. And it does take vulnerability as well, which you said earlier, because even if that's too stable people, it can be a little bit vulnerable to say, well, actually, when you do that, I don't actually like it. I'd actually prefer if you did this, if you're happy with that. And that's teamwork. And I suppose that's what a, a true relationship and partnership looks like. Absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head. Exactly. This is how you bulletproof your relationship against affairs, against divorce. This is how you raise healthy kids. This is how you stay together for 80 years. If that's what you want is a loving relationship. These are the behaviors to get you there. And a healthy person will value these behaviors. I want to do the opposite for a minute. I want to show you the opposite because a lot of people do the opposite thinking they're doing good behaviors. Let's close your eyes again. Let's do this again. Everyone at home, if you're driving, Ready? don't close your Ready? eyes, please. Let's do this. Imagine you have the worst partner in the world. And if that's old, pulled up old memories, I'm sorry for that. But imagine you have the worst partner in the world. This person never tells you what they want. Not really. 
you have to guess. They drop hints, maybe super secretive hints. And if you guess it, they're like, oh, no, ha, ha, I was just joking. That's not important. So you have to constantly play this guessing game. You have to be the CIA and try to pick their brain and interrogate them to figure out what they want from you. And if you get it wrong and you do something they don't like, or if you fail to do something they want, they do not tell you right away. They, oh, no, that's fine. No, no, that was great, babe. No, that's, that's, don't worry about it. That's fine. Just like you said, though until they have a bad day three, four, five months in, and then they blow up and vent their stress at you and tell you everything you have been doing wrong for five or six months. And it turns out to be everything. And you are the problem. And you have been so horrible to them because they do so many nice things for you. How could, why could you not read their mind and just know you should know by now what they want from you. And when you do something they do like, when you get it right, they immediately jump to guilt and, oh man, why would you do this for me? This is too much. How can I pay you back? It's this big debt. It's a big problem. They do not enjoy what you're doing for them. It makes them insecure and uncomfortable that you even did that for them. Go ahead and open your eyes and answer me these three questions. Does this person trust you? No, because they don't communicate with you what they like. <laughs> not at all. No. Number two, would you feel like a good partner if you never knew what you were doing right or wrong except when they blow up at you? No, there's no feedback. There's only negativity, as you said. This, this right here is how narcissists and people like that wound you in relationships. They drive you into the ground, convincing you you are a problem. When healthy people get in relationships with, uh, with avoidant attachment style, this is what happens to them. They get ground into the dirt and they develop attachment wounds. This right here is why. And number three, would you feel like that relationship was going to last a long time? No, because it could, nope. it could go nuclear at any moment, as you said. It's almost guaranteed to have an affair and a divorce, right? Yeah. That I mean, right there, two, two pieces to pull out of this, two pieces to pull out of this. Number one, anyone who is doing the things in the second category where you are being super nice and kind and never bothering the other person with your needs, never sharing what you want, never giving them bad feedback, never hurting their feelings and never, and, and trying to make sure they don't do nice things for you to not create a burden. You are being the bad partner. You are removing their ability and robbing them of the chance to feel trusted, secure, confident, good self-esteem, stable. You are robbing them of those good things by trying to be nice. This is why the nice guy syndrome is so bad. You are robbing the person of those things. And they feel not, they feel nothing. They feel untrusted, insecure, everything. Here's the good news. The only thing I talked about with the perfect partner was that they share their needs. They're honest with you. And that's it. That right there turns them into a perfect partner. You don't have to be stunning and gorgeous and brilliant and a millionaire. You, you become a relationship supermodel just by sharing your needs and being open and honest. If anyone yeah. here wants to be a supermodel, share your needs and be open and honest. You turn into the perfect partner because you are gifting your partner the, the ability to feel trusted, safe, secure. You're boosting their self-esteem, boosting their confidence. You are growing that relationship you can do all of that by being open and honest. And that's why that's so important to do. Yeah, Adam, incredible examples. And I think the women that I've been the most attracted to when I've been dating them have been the ones that have been the most clear on what they expect from me in terms of my standards. And then I can be clear about what I would like for them as a partner. And that's it. it works It works so much better rather than this kind of cloak and dagger approach where <laughs> maybe you do something and they really like it and they're not quite as bad as the, the worst ever partner you're naming there where they kind of, they give you some feedback but you have to guess and you have to try lots of different things until you find something that they respond well to. So I find that very, very powerful examples. And I guess when we're speaking about an important topic like this, we've evolutionary psychology clearly plays a big, big role. And I've read the blog on, on your website titled women are birds and men are warthogs. Yes. What role does evolutionary psychology play in, in your work, Adam? Oh, it's everything, everything, because our human, our, our human species, our homo sapiens species evolved to value open, honest communication. That's how families stay together. That's how families are supposed to bond. And think about it this way. We are supposed to get through these healthy, open relationships, right? Uh, four chemicals that I really look at more than that, but four, let's talk about four. 
vasopressin. So guiding, building, building responsibilities, building re relationships and bonds and connectedness through solving stress together, through team building exercises. This vasopressin, men bond best through vasopressin by solving problems together. War buddies, right? Think of war buddies. They're together for a couple years and they never, ever can ever separate ever again because their brains love each other so much. Vasopressin is responsible for so much of male bonding, especially initial male bonding to open the door then for oxytocin bonding to invest emotionally. Vasopressin is huge. It's also responsible for the lifelong relationship of the, of the bond. But think about this. There was research not too long ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, that just come out about researchers who took hamsters and mutated them so that their vasopressin would not be received in their brain. And those hamsters turned into sociopathic rage machines that could not form social bonds and they would attack and kill same sex peers because they couldn't recognize anyone as an ally. Your brain is always angry and always trying to over, overcome everybody else. And you feel alone and isolated. I'm thinking of like what mass shooters and things like that. Just think about that. So not getting that vasopressin through those bonds. You can't ever connect and solve those problems together. So your brain misses vasopressin. Does a number of things. Number two, oxytocin, warmth and care and nurturing bonding. This is huge. Um, women, women who do not have good, healthy attachment, who then give birth and try to breastfeed their child, they don't get good oxytocin flow. So their milk supply tends to dry up because oxytocin is responsible for the letdown. So a lot of anxious moms with anxious attachment style struggle with milk supply and then feel worse about themselves as a mother because they can't feed their child and their child is thin or un undernourished. I've seen that time and time again, but oxytocin is responsible for a number of things, decreasing your stress levels, helping you feel safe and nurtured and kept safe and protected. Women bond very well through oxytocin. And then when they trust you enough, then they will vasopressin bond with you because they know you can go through stress together and you won't abandon them because you're oxytocin bonded. And then serotonin is huge for fighting off depression, for managing those feelings. Serotonin floods through you with good warmth and care, good conversations like you and I are having. Our brains are serotonin bonding us together like, hey, this is great. Have talk. I should talk to Colin more often. This is fun. This is wonderful. We're having a serotonin rush, each one of us, at least I am. And that right there is also bonding us and it's going to fight off depression for the rest of the day. You and I will have elevated mood because we had this experience, this open experience. And then dopamine, you and I are feeling this like every time you smile, I'm like, oh, I made him smile. And every time I smile, you're like, oh, that felt good. We are sharing this dopamine burst back and forth four chemicals right now. They'll think about if you don't have any of those. Think about if you are, your relationships do not give you any. You do not believe you have allies. You do not understand warmth or care. And if you don't get oxytocin early in childhood, your brain shifts to mostly vasopressin bond because it thinks warmth and care won't be there. You have low serotonin from very low connection with people, high, high risk of depression and low dopamine levels. So you are constantly trying to binge, 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 binge. Now look at our society. What are people binging? Drugs, alcohol, nicotine, sugar, sugar is huge for dopamine rushes, um, porn, social phones, media. everything, everything, social media, you scroll through and it's built by the people, phones and, and social media are built by the people who did casino games. So that it's like, ding, ding. Oh, Hey, look at this message. Look at this over here. I should push this button. And it just ding, ding, ding. And then all the advertising going on, trying to pull your attention, constant dopamine, binge, binge, binge to make up for missing vasopressin, oxytocin, and serotonin. So you overcompensate with dopamine binges and you become addicted to everything around you. That right there, that's bad attachment in our society. And our society has shaped bad attachment and is now being shaped by bad attachment in return. Yeah, undoubtedly, Adam. And if we were to go back to the first of those that you discussed, which is vasopressin, you mentioned that that's vitally important for men. You gave some examples of like war pals that fought together and that bond is together forever so when they meet up at a veterans day it's like they've never been apart everything just sparks and kicks off again if we think sure. about sports teams like i played rugby growing up if i meet up with the guys that i played kind of under 17 under 18 rugby with even if i see them now we're still tight because we had a connection but it's interesting that men bond to women through vasopressin as well and i'm familiar with this genuinely just from your content actually you're the only person that's been able to teach me this I understand that in previous relationships, when I went through a challenge with that person in terms of supported them with a particular thing, so it was in one instance, it was they were going through for a, a, a fitness, a diet for a fitness photo shoot. And I was supporting them through that process as a, a kind of trusted advisor. I was helping them out. I was going and training with them. I was doing the cardio. I was helping them with their food. That built a tighter bond with that person than actually would have happened if we hadn't met in those circumstances. Equally, um, I went, I moved job and the business that I moved to was bought by an American hedge fund who made everyone redundant. So that's a traumatic period for me. 
and they were there to support me during a period where I was finding a new job, meaning that I vasopressed and bonded with that person more so again than I would have if my situation had been stable and I hadn't gone through challenge with them. So when I was listening to your content in preparation for this, it actually made me understand why that relationship maybe lasted a little bit longer than it would have done if I had been not vasopressed and bonded to them through those circumstances. If it had just been a very normal standard experience, things might have ended within their natural course more, more quickly, which I find a fascinating thought process. Absolutely. And you know what? Women intuitively know this because vasopressin also comes up again because you have to renew those vasopressin bonds every so often. If they don't come up, if it's not literal life and death war buddies, you have to renew them with those women throughout the years as, as things come up so that when the next crisis hits, you are already vasopressin bonded together and you will turn toward each other automatically. When women are in relationships and start saying, I'm bored, let's do something, we're stuck in a rut, can we go somewhere new, can we try something, can we blah, blah, blah. They are vasopressin building with you, knowing that men vasopressin bond and need vasopressin when the crisis hits. Women tend to fall out of love in long, in long stretches when it's boring because there's not much oxytocin bonding going on. Men tend to fall out of love and find somebody else when you turn those hard corners in life and you need an ally right there who's going to be working with you. Women intuitively know that and they know it on both sides. So they say, here, I need to feel warmth and care and bonded to you and I need to make sure you're vasopressin bonded with me and, and we're both vasopressin bonded together. Can we please go to a different restaurant than we have gone the last 300 times and you've ordered the same hamburger? Let's go somewhere new and try a new experience. Let's go, let's redecorate our house together and build a better house together. Let's do this thing together. Let's go out in the middle of nowhere and go camping. Let's, they're inviting you to vasopressin bond with them, even though they don't know, don't, they may not know that's the words. They are rebuilding those those pieces intuitively. And a lot of men, we like fight against that. We're like, no, why would I have more stress in my life? This is great. I love eating the same hamburger 800 times in a row with the exact same plate. That's, it's, it's, we, we fight I it, love, but if you- Yeah, I, lo I love routine and structure, Adam. And it's a huge part of like, my <laughs> to function at peak. But I definitely think a feminine quality can be more spontaneity and being a little bit more adventurous. And it's funny that evolutionary- the reason that many females are doing that is because they are trying to create new experience, new vasopressin bonding. If that's two different ways, so for example, men bond more through vasopressin, females bond more through oxytocin. Are there any other ways that it differs for creating stable attachment between a man and a woman? Yes. Think about conversations. So let's go back you know, 20,000 years, right? We, human, Homo sapiens are what, 200,000 years old and the Neolithic revolution was about 11,000 years ago. So let's go back to wandering nomads, hunting mammoths, and you and me were out on the plains and we have to communicate. There's a mammoth coming. You and I are bonding, first of all, because we've watched a few of our buddies get killed. But you and I have kept each other alive through some of these hunts. So you and I are like this. We're like, we're never going to separate ever. I would give my kidneys for you right now on the spot if you asked me to. So we are bonded. But there's a mammoth charging us. How fast should we have that conversation about that mammoth coming and what you and I should do? Real fast. Uh, immediately, yeah. Mammoth, there, you over there, me there. That's it, <laughs> done. We find a solution, we find the problem, we only communicate enough information to solve the problem, then we stop. That's male communication. It's like, okay, we value that. Straightforward, understood. You're not asking me questions, you're just telling me what to do. Very directive, very blunt. It's very like, in your face. And one of us is probably the leader, it's the one who is more confident in the moment. Like, hey, I think I have the answer to this. You do that, I'm gonna do this. And the other guy goes, that sounds good. And, and you split and you, then you try to survive this mammoth attack. That's how men have had to learn. We've had to learn that communication style because it kept us alive. Our brains go forward and back for us men. Observe, act, observe, act. That's how our brains tend to connect. Women, you don't want like five pregnant women who are in the ninth, the ninth month of pregnancy waddling around with spears trying to hunt a mammoth together. No, that, that looks wrong. <laughs> it looks wrong to our brains. You keep them home where they can take care of the child as this precious, precious resource for our future and feed the child, care for the child. Men are expendable and can die. Women are not expendable. Women should not be dying. That's, again, 20,000 years ago. We weren't built for modern day cubicle world with therapy. We're built to survive. Women were at home, so prioritizing harmony, prioritizing open context, prioritizing nurturing and care and teaching, teaching children, and prioritizing, uh, like, what, which woman in this can I share resources with? Well, the one who is open and connects with me and who shares my, view, my views and beliefs. Building that harmony through communication. Communication itself 
is not just solving a problem. Communication itself is building bonds. So they communicate more to build bonds and share that confidence and, and build attachment with each other. Women build attachment strongly through communication. Men build attachment strongly through action together and saying that person is valuable. I will trust them. That's the primary bonding and it's the primary communication. So when a man comes home and his wife says, let's talk, let me tell you about my day. I ate this piece of toast and then I saw this dog and then I, and the guy's sitting there going, what is the problem here? What am I supposed to be solving? Is there a mammoth coming? Like just throw your spear at it. And, and it's, that's the communication style. So he shuts her down. And he starts saying, well, well, you know, if you didn't like eating that piece of toast, you should have eaten something else. And she's like, what? <laughs> and then she starts complaining about this other woman at work. And he says, well, you should just club her in the head and that will solve the problem. And she's like, what? <laughs> no, just, just listen uh, to me. It's so funny that it links in entirely with a tweet that I screenshotted years in preparation for this conversation, where you said, most men don't understand how female communication works. They provide solutions, which is what you're talking about in terms of the toast, which is what they would want when a woman instead, she wants validation. When this is pointed out, most men assume it's untrue because they'd hate to receive only validation instead of a solution. Well, for example, about the toast, they would be like, oh, great, like suggest something else for me to eat. Whereas <laughs> the woman would much rather just you hear out of a problem and understand that it happened and accept it. Whereas he's like, oh no, suggest something else or how can I address this problem? And he's coming with solutions where she wants to be heard and listened to. And I find it remarkable that in this day and age where we live in a society where we, we're trying to blur the lines between men and women as much as possible, of course, our communication falls down because we're not communicating in a way that suits either of the two sexes. Yes, we are. And we're not we're not just figuring out what who needs what either. It, it's it, no one is communicating with anyone. We're all scared and angry. And when men shift that communication and women shift the communication, there's there's one. There, I'm going to teach you the, the, the magic keys. Any women who are listening who want to relate to men and any men who are listening who want to relate to women. Women, when you enter a conversation like this, up front with him, help him understand the problem that is being solved, which is, hey, I would love to share my day with you so I feel closer to you. I don't need any solutions. Can you just listen and we just talk and have fun? That right there, he's like, oh, okay, the problem is that you want to feel closer to me. And the solution is for me to just listen and make funny faces while I'm listening to you. That is, that in his brain, observe the problem, act upon the problem. That helps because the female brain goes back and forth and it hears data and then analyzes it and then puts out insight and thoughts. And so women process aloud together. Men are like, I don't need to process anything. I'm just going to observe and act. If you give him that and say, this is what I want from you. Just listen to me. Let's have a good conversation and then I'll feel closer to you. He's going to be like, oh, that's easy. I can do that. That makes sense now. And with men, when you enter conversation with women and they start talking about toast and about dogs and about all that, and you're like, where's the point? What are we doing? Stop and say, hey, I, I would love to just talk to you and hear you out. I want to make sure you're getting what you need. So are you wanting me to listen or do I need to jump to solutions? Which one is it right now? And they'll say, no, I just want you to listen most of the time because that's where they're at in that bonding process. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. If you do that, fantastic. And then men also do this additional thing. When you have a problem, talk to her about it in this specific way. Talk to her, come home, tell her what your problem is. Hey, you know, there's this guy at work. I just want to tell you this thing that's happening and get your insight. I want to get your insight. You're solving a purpose. You're solving a problem. I want to get your insight on this. There's this dude at work. And he's really making me mad. I think, and then you state your solution. I think I'm just going to club him in the head because he's making me so mad. But before I do that, <laughs> what do you think about that? Can you give me any insight of anything I have missed? Not should I do it? You're not turning your, your decisions over to her like she's your mom. What are your insights? Can you tell me what you think there? Am I missing something? And she will say, hmm, well, have you thought about not clubbing him in the head because then they will fire you? And you're like, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. The female brain goes back and forth and makes those analytical choices and, and, and connects the pieces. I do this with my wife all the time. And what I tell people is, men, if you want to have sex with your wife, like eight times a day kind of thing, if you want to amp her drive up, if you want to amp her drive up in a good natural way with female Viagra, it is emotional intimacy because you are coming to her and saying, I value your insight. I value your input, your experience, your wisdom, your thoughtfulness. All of that is what I value about you, not just your body. And what that tells her is I can gain in value to you as I age instead of decreasing in value if you only value my beauty. If you keep her out and don't bring her into your, your situations like this, the message you're sending is I don't care about your insight. 
I'm only here to solve problems. I don't care what you have to say. You solve your problems. You are over there. Just stay pretty. And when she is 65 years old, she will not be as pretty as she is at 20, most likely. It just doesn't happen that way. So she is running the risk of being less valuable than the next woman who walks by. When you share with her that you are, you value her insight, you value her thoughtfulness, her advice, her experience, her wisdom, she gains in that and becomes tremendously valuable to you. Her stability and security goes way up. And then again, 200,000 years ago, her sex drive would amp way up because it says, I am with a stable man who values me, who is thoughtful. I know his internal processes. I know how he makes decisions and he will never, ever give me up because I become more valuable with every passing week and every passing year, I'm more valuable to him. So I should have 50 babies with this man. That's that, what her brain will say. That level That's of actionable advice in terms of communication is incredible, Adam, because as you said, women can frame what they want from the man at the start, meaning that he feels like he's contributing solutions and men can either ask the question in terms of, is this what you want from me? Or as you said, share their problems and outsource not the entire decision, but the decision-making process. And I love off the back of it that you said that it would create emotional intimacy, which of course is how the female becomes most attracted physically to the man as well, rather than just being uh, an object. And speaking of women being seen as objects you've spoken a lot about hookup culture both on podcasts but also with your twitter as well and it's so prevalent now and you tweeted something that stood out to me that a damaged man is incapable of love because he does not believe love will be freely given only earned through works he seeks false intimacy in lust and mistakes sex for acceptance these men seek insecure women who believe themselves unlovable and use sex to earn approval so because of what we learned through this conversation we can learn that this is quite often anxious women that this man is hooking up with but mm -hmm. when a man is trying to earn love what's going on there like why isn't he stable why is he trying to earn love and what is he doing men who are trying to earn the approval of other people think that their life depends on the approval of the other people that's what it is it's a man who doesn't believe he has power and control because he never had power and control over anything because it was taken away from him over and over and over as a child and he has either become avoidant because he had to fight tooth and nail to get any level of control or he is anxious because he will never, he believes he will never have any kind of control. And the only control he has is pushing buttons to make people happy. That is what it is. It's men who are terrified because they have no control. And when men find that they have that healthy control in the relationships, the healthy attachment, the secure attachment, sharing their problems with their wife and getting her insight right there, those pieces, he can control those. And it's not about making other people happy so they'll, and pushing their buttons. It's about building a fulfilling relationship between two human beings so that you can trust each other in openness. That right there is the maximum level of power because now you have actualized yourself and your relationship. Yeah, incredible. And it tends to be mostly avoidant men that would fall into hookup culture. Is that right? Because as a, I guess a stable man in a particular mindset would consider hookup culture because of how society has maybe made us behave. But that's displaying avoidant traits. I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Yeah. Avoidant men in hookup culture are the ones that try to go through as many women as they can. And they might be proud of their prowess and how good they are, but then they move on to the next woman the moment she develops any kind of feelings at all. And anxious men who go into hookup culture are the ones who try to minimize the number of women they are with typically, but they try to become incredibly clingy and they care really much about being the perfect lover and giving her 500 physical climaxes so to speak, because they are, they need to earn her approval and make her like them and show her that he's better than other guys. I am not like any of those other guys. I promise. And then they get overly attached and connected and clingy and avoidant women are like, Oh, I have five guys on the hook and I don't care about any of them. That's that cycle. Yeah. An absolutely lethal cycle and society is definitely perpetuating that. One of the last areas I want to go with you, Adam, um, is around a meme that you shared on May the 3rd and, uh, you got some praise for this, but you got some criticism as well, which I think Twitter inevitably brings forward, doesn't it? And the meme mm -hmm. was an example, and it was four different corners within a grid. And it was four examples of a woman either greeting, praising, or complimenting a man. And That's your cool. caption simply said, this would shatter the male suicide epi epidemic. Why yes. is that? 
So it was taking things that uh, women complain about catcalling and whatnot and turning it into women catcalling men and complimenting them and saying, oh, you're too smart to be working as a cashier or you should smile more. You would look great. Or, hey, that outfit looks great on you from strangers. And for women, those things are terrifying because it's random guys like, oh, but guys, guys only get a compliment every five to 10 years. Most guys, and they are isolated. They are cold. They are separated. Most men don't remember the last time they got a hug, even from their own mom sometimes. And if they do remember, they've held on to it for five or 10 years. A lot of guys, if you see in the comments on that meme, like you've got a hundred thousand likes or something. A lot of guys chimed in like, Hey, I remember the time seven years ago that an old lady in Seven Eleven told me my shirt looked nice. And I have worn that same shirt every time I've gone to any kind of professional event because that's the only that's the only kind thing I ever heard. That right there, so many men are alone, isolated, and afraid. And we get suicidal when we think that the pain will never stop and that we will never gain any power to stop it or make ourselves feel better or achieve a mission or bond with anybody else. And the suicide epidemic is just out of control. That is the real epidemic going on right now. No one wants to talk about it. That would end, I, I shouldn't say end, it's not every suicide would end, but if men felt connected, felt loved, felt bonded, if people were kind to men and treated men like human beings, even within their own families, if sisters went out to hug their brothers more often, if female cousins went out and hugged male cousins, if aunts and, and uncles and grandfathers, if everybody was kinder to men and gave them more warmth and affection, men would not feel so alone and they may open up more about their concerns and then work together to solve them. And that's how men overcome suicidal feelings and depression is by opening up and getting new data from other people and building solutions together, which gives us the vast suppression bonding, makes us not feel alone, right? The hamsters who become sociopaths and, and killers and destructive if they feel totally isolated and alone, those guys turn it on themselves. They hate themselves for it. If we could do that, if we could be kinder to men and treat them like human beings in society, that would change everything. That would change. It would at least open the door then for more solutions that would also solve the male suicide epidemic. Yeah. And, and more solutions like leading towards giving them the ability to feel empowered and able to do things like you said, because if you, um, I think one of the example compliments you gave was like somebody saying, oh, you're so smart to help me with my computer or something like that. Yes, and that's right. And it just validates that they've got capability, not that you should be chasing validation, but because it's sincere and it's meant and yes. it's off the back of doing good work, yes. it gives the man a purpose and a feeling of being able to contribute. And I've seen you say again, somewhat controversially, which I find bizarre in this day and age, that female and male depression should be treated differently. And I yes. find that a remarkable thing for people to get upset about when you've got somebody who is a trained psychotherapist <laughs> giving you that commentary and who's helped thousands of people being told, oh, no, how dare you try and <laughs> differentiate male and female depression? But you've spoken mm -hmm. there in terms of, like, men being given more sincere compliments and feeling more affection and support. But what's important about men when it comes to, like, finding purpose and mission? How, how can that address depression? What, how does that all work? Purpose and meaning for men typically comes, almost always comes from relationships in some way, meaning you are going to build a powerful family. You are going to build a healthy company of a big thriving company of human beings. You're going to build a, a thriving family of human beings. You're going to mentor human beings. You are going to leave a lasting impact on the human race. It all comes down to your connectedness to other human beings and your ability to leave a lasting human impact. That's legacy. So that, that is ultimate meaning for us men. It is not just, hey, I'm going to build the ultimate Lego thing and then it's going to crumble and, and explode when I die and it will mean nothing. That's really not meaning for men. That's meaningless. Meaning for men is leaving a lasting human impression. That's, that's legacy. And we must have healthy attachment to be able to maximize that so that we can connect to other human beings instead of playing other people like objects and pushing their buttons and trying to make them be good. We work with them to build fulfilling relationships. And then your relationships themselves become your legacy. The relationships you have are your legacy. That right there is key. So helping men understand that they're not alone that they can give and receive love with other people. That's one big thing about that. The, the compliment, the tongue in cheek there is that men must experience love to believe that they deserve love and they must experience love to understand what love even feels like. Helping men understand what love feels like and helping women understand what love feels like 
That is key. That's why I always tell people it's crap to say you have to love yourself before anyone else can love you. That is garbage because if nobody has ever loved you, you do not believe you deserve love and you will not love yourself because you do not think it's possible. When you start to receive love from somebody else, it feels amazing and incredible. And you get that flood of chemicals, vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine. You get that flood through your brain. And it's the first time you've had all those chemicals activated the right way. And it becomes the most addictive feeling on earth because it's what you're designed for. It's what our animals, our, our, our human animal species has been built to thrive on because the survivors would have the biggest flood of vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, all of those, the more flood of that, with that cocktail we get, the healthier and safer we are and the more likely to survive. So our brains thrive on it. And when we don't have it, we go crazy. So showing people that they are loved in any way, that right there is the biggest step. Showing somebody genuine love and then explaining to them why you're showing them that love, that you're not pitying them, but you really care about them. And then opening the door for them to be honest with you and saying, hey, I know sometimes you seem kind of nervous or standoffish or you're afraid to open up with me. That's okay. That is okay. I would be happy if you ever did and we would work together on whatever problems are going on. I just want you to know that if you're ever ready for that, I would love to have that conversation with you. And that's going to scare the crap out of them and they're going to try to jump out the window, but probably later they are going to come back and sneak back in and say, hey, did you really mean that? And then start testing it. And that's and then, love. Yeah. yeah. So much of what you said, Adam, links into the ability to communicate well. And I do think that's a skill that we're losing in the modern generation with technology now well technology is a fantastic tool for us to have discussions like this from the other side of the world it's it's really quite damaging to how we're able to communicate with people and it would be quite hard to have some of these conversations over text or whatsapp or instagram whereas if you're in person with somebody it's much easier to have the conversations in terms of i want to be open and honest with you i want to tell you about the things that i like and i don't like and i want us to work together to solve those and i want you to feel complimented because complimenting somebody through a screen has almost lost its its meaning because a, a double tap or a like on Instagram it is a compliment. And then like 10 years ago when that was new, yeah. there probably was an element of we received that and felt it. Whereas now we're we've completely hedonically adapted to receiving these likes and these yeah. first I mean. So of course receiving a sincere compliment in person, that man remembering it from seven years ago when the lady uh, at the supermarket said he had a nice shirt, that stayed with him. Whereas he might have got told on Instagram that, oh, yeah, like you're looking really smart. And that will just go in one ear, out the other. Not a problem totally. at all. Yes, in person has much more of an impact. Totally. You know, part of the problem with articulating these things, and I was just talking to my buddy Josh Terry about this, and he put it a great way, is all of these are child phrases. Like, hey, I don't like that. Hey, I do like that. Hey, do this. Hey, can we be friends? Hey, let's do this. Hey, this is what I want from you. That's what kids say. I, I, I have four kids myself, and that is how they talk. They're like, dad. Hey, I want this. Hey, dad, can we do that? Hey, dad, don't do that. Hey, dad, this bothers me. Hey, dad, let's do this. And it's very clear and very open. It's it's regressing to a child state, but intentionally doing it with purpose to achieve a shared mutual outcome together. That's really what it comes down to. Communicate more like children, but do it for an adult purpose. That's really what it boils down to. If you can just tell people, hey, I want you go to somebody and you're having a problem with them and they, they aren't able to be open with you and you say, hey. I would love for our relationship to be better than ever and for us to be friends forever. Can we be more honest with each other and open about what we want? And then we can be even better friends. And I promise I will work with you to solve problems. That's simple language. And that's like little kids. My, my, my four-year-old could understand that, right? And you, I'm saying that to you, and you're probably not sitting there going, oh, Adam, that sounds terrible. I would hate it if someone told me that. No, you would love it, right? Yeah, exactly. As, as the example you gave me, when you gave me an example of secure attachment, I was nodding my head in terms of that's the ideal partner because you know exactly how you both want to behave towards one another and you get the positive feedback loop all the time. It's the same as like if you find activities that you enjoy, whether that's the gym or running or something like that, you get a positive feedback loop after it, so you do it again. So if somebody in your relationship gives you positive feedback on behaviors and supports and things that you say to them, mm -hmm. it might even be in the bedroom, things that you like, you tell them then you do that again because it helps them enjoy the sex in, this, in the way that you want to, You want them to enjoy the sex. It's, it's, it's remarkable how much more we can gain from life if we are open and vulnerable enough to communicate those things. And quite often, as long as it's not something that's really strange, you'll probably find somebody out there that accepts you. 
don't scare them off the swimming too too crazy but yeah really 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 powerful <laughs> i've uh, i've absolutely loved that and you you said during the conversation we were talking about those four different hormones that um there be serotonin going off off the back of this conversation i'm sure that we're going off for many of the people who have listened to this as well we've maybe learned some better ways to create better attachment with their partners but also their family as well which i think was a a really important note for you to touch on too adam but for people that want to continue the conversation with you where should they head towards oh boy two two key places right now over on youtube i'm adam lane smith not adam smith adam lane smith l-a-n-e on youtube i've got uh 120 plus videos and and three more added every single week so i'll hit 200 300 here before long adam lane smith on youtube 120 free guides over there and then i'm over on tiktok at, at attachment bro on tiktok where i do three lives a week um, I, I do just pump out constant TikTok videos about really short snippets with attachment, dating, relationships, everything you need to know. Both are free. And then from there, I've got link trees in, in both bios that point you to everything else I offer with books, courses, everything. I love it, Adam. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you to you, the listener, for listening. And again, I'm sure you've enjoyed this one. If you have done, please take a screenshot, pop on your Instagram story, tag me at call.cambro, and I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.